any potential new members here? You can pass. Uh, excuse me, Joe. Maybe you want to rephrase that because now I'm assuming all you see are old faces and oh. I'm not <laughs> happy with that part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good one, Ellen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're probably right about the old faces. <laughs> uh, I got a birthday coming up, and uh, it's hard to comprehend. You know? Yeah, I got one coming up, too, and you're right. It's like when I was in high school, it's like, oh, God, no. Who would even think of being 30? Because, you know, that was, like, really ancient. Oh. Well, I, I'm starting my uh, fourth quarter of a century, so. Uh, well. <laughs> That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah. Well, yeah. remember what they said in the 60s. Never, don't trust anyone over 30. <laughs> yeah, we're all untrustworthy, I'm sure. Well, I guess so. All right. Joe, we do have uh, a uh, new person joining this time. It's uh, Brian Jensen. We got him a, uh, yeah. uh, Is this a link to join just a few minutes ago. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll once we get started, we'll call for introductions here. Okay. Uh, well, I've got five uh, after, so why don't we go on and let's um, get... Just give me a minute, Joe. I We've got a bunch more people to come in here. Oh, wow, great. I'm working as fast as I can. Joe, your clock's running faster than mine because I'm only a minute past seven. Yeah, yep. my computer says 701, but it's nothing yeah, wrong with too. being excited about the camera club. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking over at the uh, wall clock. I should look at my computer here. Yeah, yeah. 701. I just turned 702, so, huh? <laughs> I, did that, I did that with my airplane club. I went a month early, and they never have it in January, and I showed up like, what are you doing here? It's like, well, I thought we had an uh, airplane club. <laughs> okay what kind of plane do you have i don't have any right now but i'm also on the board of directors at the eaa chapter 1158 out of west bend i'm a lapsed pilot too old to fly anymore Okay, Joe. I quit flying when I figured out that it was money that kept the plane in the air. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, it's not you cheap. You can start, Joe. I'm sorry? You can start now. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, the question I have is, do we have any guests tonight? And I understand we have a, a Brian Jensen here. Is that correct? Yep. Brian? Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> Barely, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, really? Well, we well what we normally do is uh, like to introduce you and have you tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're into a camera club. <laughs> um, I've been into photography for a lot of years, um, and been a member of a few different clubs. I'm currently a member of the Racine Club. Um, okay. But I've looked at your site and it looked interesting. So I thought, well, I'll join, look at joining your club. Um, I do a lot of different type of photography, um, a lot of macro and um, a lot of nature and then a lot of astronomy. So. Ah, that must be one of your moonshots behind you. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, we meet, uh, as you know, uh, once a month. Uh, we're a fairly active club. Uh, we kind of do just about anything and everything with a wide range of topics and guest speakers. So uh, uh, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Uh, you. Before we go further, I have great news. According to what I heard today, we only have 19 days till spring. Uh, I'm just tickled pink, to be quite frank about it. Uh, I grew up down south. Uh, I've had enough of this winter stuff. Um, tonight, uh, I want to thank everybody that submitted their pictures for the uh, Architectural ang Angles Challenge. Uh, we'll see those a little bit later this evening. 
A few reminders. Um, a big thanks to Ellen, as always. Uh, anything and everything we talk about tonight, um, you'll find in the newsletter. Uh, if you don't, I, I print mine out. I keep it in a notebook. I've got the last three or four years of newsletters here, and there's always something I go back to in there uh, to pick up information. Um, but uh, Ellen, you, I don't know what we'd do without you, to be quite frank about it. Uh, you, you keep this club uh, glued together. and That'd be the right word, I think. No, yeah. I can just put words on paper. Well, you do a good <laughs> job with it, and uh, we we'd absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, a big uh, reminder as well that uh, the uh, yearly show, uh, Community Spotlights, is going to be in June this year. And uh, we need you to get those uh, together as quick as possible. Off to Jane. Uh, she does a great job putting together that slideshow, and I'm sure she'd appreciate, appreciate having those uh, rather sooner than later. Um, uh, and again, you know, Jane's been doing this for quite a few years and uh, another fantastic uh, job. Uh, Jane, you have any, I don't know, is Jane here tonight? I don't think I saw her pop up here. Anyway, she's- uh, Yeah, she's I'm here. here. <laughs> yeah, I can't see everybody here. Uh, uh, Jane, is there anything you need in particular that uh, related Just to the Community Spotlight? Just when you send the images, make sure you mark it, you know, Menominee Falls Camera Club slideshow, something okay. so that I don't think it's uh, nothing. Okay. Well, get them to her. Uh, she normally wants, what, uh, eight pictures or so? Eight that pictures. Okay. Eight max. 2,100 long side. Yep. Okay. I don't so critique them. I don't curate them, you know, whatever you send, that's what's going to be in the slideshow. Okay. Uh, I think you know tonight we have a, uh, a program, but before we get to that at the end of our, uh, at eight o'clock or so, a reminder that in April, uh, we have uh, Hank Erdman, a uh, representational of artistic photography. Um, that, that, I think that's going to be a really good one as well. In May, we have Hazel Meredith, uh, working with textures and overlays. Um, but more importantly, after May, after we have these programs wrapped up through May, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, instead of having a program, we're going to have sessions where we ask all of you to provide information about what you do with the photos you take. You put them in albums, you share them with family, you frame them, you sell them. What do you do? I think um, June should be a rather interesting, uh, uh, not a program, but an end of, you know, a rather interesting uh, observation of what you do with your pictures. I really can't hear, can't wait to hear what some of you uh, take an interest in and do with those. Um, so that's uh, after we get through April and May. So that's going to be in, in June, and we'll probably spend a full hour just having that discussion. Um, in July, we're going to meet July the 12th. That's a week after our normal time. I think it's because of uh, 4th of July is somewhere in through there. And that's, we're hoping that's going to be a different meeting. We're hoping that's going to be a one-on-one -on -one where you'll come together uh, with us as a group at, in Menominee Falls at one of the local parks that we've already reserved a, um, what do you call it, Pat? A, um, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a shelter. Okay. Picnic shelter. But it's, uh, and we'll provide more information as we get to it. I've got a group of about four or five that are going to come together here in the next uh, five, six weeks and uh, try to finalize some plans and we'll share all that information uh, coming down the line. But if you have ideas that you would like us to uh, take a look at, uh, please email me with those or give me a call and we'll try to incorporate what you would like to see happen at that uh, gathering face-to-face. -face. Uh, it's good to see you on the internet here uh, with Zoom. And we're probably not even going to recognize you in real life if you show up. 
but uh, I think it'd be a great outing. Uh, we hope to have uh, some refreshments, non-alcoholic, according to what the regulations say. Uh, maybe some ice cream. Who knows? We might have, they're, they're just don't tell it. Once we come together, we'll put together all that information and uh, get it out to you as quick as we can. But uh, if you're going to be around, we'd love to see you. Our last meeting of the year, uh, July the 12th. It'll probably be in uh, late afternoon, uh, early evening uh, in Menominee Falls. Joe. Yeah. So that you recognize everybody in person, everyone should bring a picture frame <laughs> to hold in front of their face. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Okay, we'll come up with some ideas and try to pull this thing off and uh, hopefully uh, be able to wrap up the year in, a, in an outdoor adventure and uh, have some fun with it. Um, the president's uh, challenge for next month is going to be a fun one. Uh, the topic is dawn, golden hour, blue hour, and night. If you can't work one of those times, I got a real problem. <laughs> Uh, we, we should have a wide variety of things on that particular uh, April challenge. Uh, speaking of challenges, uh, the challenge for this month was architectural angles. I probably have about six people that uh, submitted images. And uh, what I'd like to do right now, before we get the show and tell tips and wacko and all that other stuff, uh, let me run through that real quick. And uh, it's going to be a short little... Um, slideshow that I put together. So hang with me for a second as I move your pictures out of the way and I'll show that. I better share the screen first. Hmm. Get back to my right page. That's not it. Well, I have lost my Zoom page. Here we go, right here. No music. <laughs> I'm going to have to work on having music for you. <laughs> I'm afraid to bring any music. I, I might get fussed at. I could send you one song that you could use right. over and over. <laughs> All right. 
Thanks uh, to those that submitted images. I sure appreciate it. Get back to my agenda here. Man, those, those went by a little quick. Another second on each one would have been nice. <laughs> one second, please. Here we go. So uh, I'd appreciate uh, getting images from uh, all of you uh, for next month. Uh, dawn, golden hour, blue hour, and night. Um, Joe, are these on the website then after your? Uh, no, they're not. Okay. You want me to put them on the website? Well, if you send them I, to me, I'll put them on the website. I think okay. there are some fantastic images there. So okay. kind of. I'll, I'll get them off the Yeah. Right. Why don't you send me all of them for this year in the okay. different categories? And oh, I'll, okay. I'll, post, I'll create a whole um, new page for that. All right. Thank you very much. Sure, because it's something we, we actually do monthly. So, yeah. Yeah, why not? Okay. All right. Um, Show and tell. Uh, before we get to Jesse and Chris, uh, a reminder, next month we have, uh, uh, is that Lennon, L-I-N-N-E-A? How do you pronounce that? Linnea? Sorry, I had it on yeah, mute. It is Linnea. Okay. And then uh, Pat Lynch. Uh, but for this week or this month, uh, we have Jesse and Chris. Uh, who wants to go first? I can go first. All right, take it away. In early February, Jane and I went out and about and we're taking some pictures in the snow. This was at um, Covered Bridge. Of course, it isn't the Covered Bridge, but I like that walkway. We went up to um, Wabaka looking for old buildings, came across the um, Wabaka Fire Department built in 1904. And I thought it picture was okay, but you know me, I like to do a little bit more to it too. So mm -hmm. I took it into um, it's called Smart Photo Editor, one of my software programs, and I don't know, it kind of made it look like a some type of a painting. <laughs> then we went over to Stony Hill Schoolhouse. That was kind of neat. I wish I would have got the flag in there, but that flag would be way off the screen. <laughs> it is huge flagpole. So I don't have the flag. And again, it, it's a nice little old building, but I did this to it, another um, effect from the smart photo editor. Then we went up to Harrington Beach. Yeah, it was a windy day and had a lot of waves coming in. And I just thought that was kind of neat looking. I didn't do anything to this one. <laughs> and from there we ended up, well, we went at the port, but there was nothing going on there. And then we ended up at, um, Lime Kiln Park in Grafton. I was up to port for a sunrise and I wanted to get these clouds in the sunrise. And of course, just when I clicked, these geese flew in front of me. And of course my shutter speed wasn't fast enough to get them in focus, but I still liked it. I liked the colors and that. And this past weekend, well, not this weekend, but last Sunday, week ago Sunday, we went to the zoo. And this is one of the cheetahs. And of course, through the glass, the glass was all streaked and dirty. And so I had to clean that up. And of course, then I put a different background into it. So you didn't see all the other stuff back there. And I was so thrilled to get a decent penguin picture. I can never get pictures in that building. and. They look nice. Of course, he did have, it said exit down here, a reflection. So I got that out of there. But then today I thought he needed some help. He didn't look quite right there. 
so I put them in the snow. <laughs> there we go. Different backgrounds in there and some fog and lots of snow. <laughs> and this was from the bike race this past summer. And I was just playing around with some effects in um, Topaz Studio. This is the Topaz Studio One, a free version. And it's some type of a, well, I think it's called background painter. And then I threw on a um, grunge effect on it too. And this is one of my older horse pictures. And again, I did this in um, Topaz Studio some type of their effects. That is all I have. All right. This would be nice to send to Jeff as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, uh, you're next. Okay, I have unmuted and I will do the uh, screen sharing. Trying to find my screen. <laughs> there it is. Okay, you should see a picture of a sailboat and a uh, humpback whale. Not yet. Nope, you're, uh, you're not sharing yet. I'm sharing eight. Did you hit the green button and then you, after you hit and then the I gotta pick one, a certain. Yeah, you need to pick whatever screen the uh, photo's on and then hit share. Okay, there is no share button anymore after I hit that. It must be on, you must be on the, the one where you pick um, what screen you're gonna share. Can you pull that up? I get a one in the upper left-hand corner. Let's lose that. Hmm. Yeah, that would be your, your first screen. Um, in the lower right-hand corner should be a share button. I think you're probably right in between the two. <laughs> Halfway to sharing. Let's lose this. Let's use that. Use that. I'm trying to close every window I have. Yeah. If nothing else, bring up the Zoom window again. Yeah, I've got the Zoom window. You see it? Oh, now yeah. I, okay, now I'm just going to hit screen share again. Yeah. And then you pick which display, and then there's another share button on the lower right hand of that box. Okay. There we go. Looks like there I'm doing business now, right? Yes, yep. sir. Okay. Now you should see a, a sailboat and a whale. Is that right? Yep. Yes. Good. Uh, this was a whale watch I took off the coast of Massachusetts several years ago. And uh, since I've been bored sitting at home and I finally got a piece of software that allows me to add different skies, I have been adding skies and things like crazy to uh, my pictures from years ago and trying to make them a little more impactful. The actual whale was there. And I just, all that's added to is the sky. And I thought that produced uh, a nice effect. This is another uh, whale watching picture that uh, I added a sky to and obviously you can tell it's added because the uh, this, the ocean doesn't look anything like the ocean should look at that time of night or afternoon. One of the problems with whale watches is they all happen during the day and the sky is pretty boring. So it's really not within my budget to commission a whale watch at a time of day when the sky would look interesting. So I have uh, reduced myself to changing uh, the skies out. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a pilot. This is something I took over Massachusetts several years ago. Uh, 
when I was above the clouds and I, it was a nice day and I kind of like seeing clouds from that side of uh, the world. Uh, another air show, this one was uh, from Oshkosh. And again, another problem with uh, air shows is the sky is usually blue and in the middle of the day. So it needs a better sky than, uh, than is really there. So again, that's uh, another sky I stuck in there. Uh, now we're moving to a, a covered bridge in Southern Vermont. Uh, this was an interesting bridge because I had to drive about 23 miles down a dirt road to get to it. Although you can see the road is paved near the bridge where the town is, but it's about as far as I've ever gone off the beaten track to get a picture. Uh, that's a penguin. It's called an African penguin, I believe. It was at a zoo I uh, visited some years ago. Uh, one of the things I've been doing this summer is uh, buying flowers at the grocery store and taking pictures of them in my, uh, my bedroom just to have something to do. And this flower happened to show up for $7.98 uh, in a bouquet. So I put my little studio together and just took a picture of it. Oops. Uh, that's uh, a picture in Pittsfield, Vermont, of a Quaker meeting house, uh, which is on a uh, farm that used to belong to the Quakers back in the uh, 1900s or early 1900s when the last Quakers uh, uh, stopped being Quakers, I guess. But it was a nice perspective of a, of a fence. Uh, again, off the coast of Massachusetts, uh, seagulls are uh, uninteresting to, to take pictures of. And I, I kind of like it when I can get a picture with more than one bird in the picture and try to get them all in focus, which is a challenge I, I set for myself sometimes. Uh, an interesting horse I came across in my travels. I'm not sure what kind of horse that is, but I've never seen anything quite like it before. And this is more of a, a standard horse at a little farm in Vermont. Uh, I've uh, spent many hours uh, in my backyard setting up the right uh, situation to take pictures of hummingbirds. Usually I like to use a white background from a, an old bed sheet and just put that next to the hummingbird feeder. And if necessary, just edit out the hummingbird feeder if the bird happens to be too close to it. Uh, this is off the coast of Vermont, or excuse me, Mass of Maine. And uh, the... Uh, Lighthouse, you could probably tell, is not a real lighthouse. It came from uh, my brother's bedroom where he had a, a little figurine of a lighthouse that I was able to take a picture of. And I've stuck it in maybe about seven or eight uh, seascapes that I've uh, had over the uh, years. Again, something to do in the, in the wintertime. Uh, this is a lighthouse in Oregon, which is actually pretty straightforward. It's on a bluff. So what you're seeing is the whole lighthouse, which is only about 15 feet high. And because it's on a bluff over the Pacific, it, uh, it didn't have to be that big, but I've never seen a lighthouse that quite looked like that before. So it's an interesting picture. Uh, some years ago, I went to an orchid show and these two orchids uh, attracted my attention. Red always attracts my attention when I'm taking pictures. Uh, these are some of my neighbors. I don't know who they are, but I was in a park uh, on Halloween and they were setting up some pictures of themselves. And I happened to be across the pond and saw them from a distance. So I just uh, borrowed their effort and took a picture of them uh, playing uh, some little game. And again, birds flying, uh, something I like to do. And these two were kind of nice to look at. Uh, another thing I've chased over the years is waterfalls. This one is in uh, Western Massachusetts, I believe. And that's another one in that general area. And another one. And we're back to little flowers that I took a picture of uh, in my uh, bedroom. The black, uh, I only have white backgrounds, but I... Uh, I found a pair of black pants and draped that over the white background and I was able to create a black background, uh, which uh, and with a little bit of Photoshopping uh, took care of all the uh, material uh, 
artifacts in the uh, from the pants and made it just solid black. But it's a cheap way to get a black background, I guess. And one of the few things I've, the very few times in my uh, photography career is getting close to a wood duck. As you know, they're uh, they're rather reticent to have their pictures taken, and they they see me, they tend to go off in another direction. And this time I was just lucky enough to uh, to get a couple of wood ducks that. Uh, we're within the range of my uh, my 400 millimeter lens, and that, my dear friends, is all I have to uh, to offer for the moment. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the next topic for the evening. Uh, Can I interrupt a minute, Joe? Um, looking at his orchid show, uh, there's the possibility um, of a field trip going to the orchid show. Are people interested in that? I don't know. I know some of you have already gone. I think, yeah, I'm okay. I, and yeah, I'm sure you would have been there already <laughs> twice. I, I had to go early. So I went uh, <laughs> last week, Okay, two, two weeks okay. ago. I'm just checking right now to see how long the, it goes. It runs it goes through, on Tuesday morning. through March goes, 27th. Yeah. Yeah, I think the yeah. orchid show in, uh, at the gardens there, uh, they're open Tuesday morning early for photographers. Uh, and they have a limit of uh, 30 photographers uh, each Tuesday morning. Um, I've kind of forgotten the, the time. I think it's 8, 30, 8 to 9.30 or... 8, no, 8 it's 8.15 to 9.45. And I just threw it in the newsletter in case... In case people wanted to go to it, or it was a possibility, I'm not saying that it's a for sure thing, but um, <clears throat> if I don't write things down, sometimes I forget things. Well, the good thing about it, if you drive down as a group, you're only paying for one parking car, but you still have to pay for admission, uh, especially if you're not a member of the uh, of the. Um, I think you have to pay to get into the building and then you have to pay for the orchid show, if I recall. So they, they changed things this year, so so everybody knows. So parking now costs um, to go. So it costs yeah. to park there and it costs to get into uh, the orchid, into the gardens now. Um, you used to, I think, only pay for parking. Uh, so now they've changed it. Um, so for the orchid show, you would buy tickets for the orchid show and then there's parking on top of it. I think it's like okay. $8 for parking. Um, and all that information is available as well uh, on their website. Um, yeah, I'm checking real uh, quick to see if any of the photographer shows are still even available because they sell out. Yeah, they go pretty quick from what I've heard. The, the orchid show itself is open every day. Right now, it's just you can't use a tripod. Yeah. Um, yeah. The photographer hour, you can use a tripod and if you want to bring lights and all that stuff. Okay. Well, I know there's been several of you that have already gone to that. Um, you think? <clears throat> do you think it's worth a trip? I do it yeah. every year. Yeah, it's nice. Okay. Yeah. Even if, even if you don't Brian do the photographer hour, it's nice. Yeah. I think it Ken goes Brian through and I went from 10 o'clock till noon and if you pick a nice cloudy day it works out pretty well yeah. and it's not super crowded well so. that's good i think weekends are the busiest time from what i've heard okay yeah i i don't think i'd want to go on a weekend but during the weekday um even from 10 o'clock till whenever they go to it okay. doesn't work out that bad and um yeah you have to pay to get in pay for the orchid show um, and the parking's eight bucks. So, for all car. right. Well, I'd love to see uh, some uh, pictures from uh, your old adventures uh, maybe next month. Bring them on. You never know. All right. So, uh, do we have anybody, Joe, that was interested in going in the future or not? I know I'm going down with my uh, uh, wife and uh, my daughter next week. Um, uh, Anybody want to tag along on uh, Wednesday of next week? I mean, Thursday of next week? I'll be glad to meet you there. <laughs> or does anybody want to lead a field trip? Let's put it that way. 
Yeah, we would have put it out for Ken, Brian, and I, but um, yeah. I don't. I don't find out about stuff to the last second, and uh, I think we made the decision to finally go on a Wednesday afternoon, and we went on Thursday morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I would invite you to uh, go down there if you can, and uh, we'd love to see your results. All right, let's move on to, to tips and hints. Um, Brian, I think you're going to talk to us about uh, shooting videos with digital camera. Am, am I correct? Yes, that is absolutely true. Well, take it away. <clears throat> okay. Let's see if I can figure out the share screen. Uh, let's see. Here we go. So. Uh, See, Jeff, is there something special I have to do to uh, share audio? Um, when you shared screen, uh, you need to check the box share audio. So stop your share. And then when you get that in between box that shows up, um, there's a first I, share first I press audio. share. Okay. Yeah. I see. Share screen. I got it. I got yeah. it. Thank At you. the bottom left. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's go away. And then. Uh... Let's see. Okay. 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 Uh, <laughs> so what it's going to share went away and then I brought it back up and I guess I'm going to have to do it again. I'm sorry. Figure it out one of these days. Yeah, hit cancel and get it set up and then hit the share. Yeah, yeah. Third time hopefully is a charm. Yeah. Click share sound. Click optimize for video. Click. There we go, I think. Yeah, looks like it's it. Videography? Yep. Okay, good. So, let's see. So, I um, thought I'd share some of uh, what I've learned about shooting videos with uh, interchangeable lens cameras. Um, let's see, we're going to... Get on the next screen. It's a little bit of delay here. So it's, this is a bit of an outline. I'm going to show three sample videos um, with different technology cameras. Um, I'm going to talk about why I use a DSLR or a, a mirrorless camera. Uh, when to shoot videos. Some basic settings. We'll talk about shooting videos. Then we'll talk about editing and sharing videos, and and talk about some. Uh, some editors. Uh, this first one, this is actually an old one. This is my mother, Sylvia. And I think this is a good example of something to shoot a video of. So this captures my mother's laugh. She's telling a story. What the story is about really isn't important, but just <laughs> trying to capture. But why he went to the eye doctor in the mirror? <laughs> I have not, not heard this story before. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something that's kind of priceless. Um, I shot that on a eight millimeter Sony camcorder oh, back in the early nineties. The videography isn't great, but it's just, it, it shares something that's, uh, you know, very important, precious, if you will, to our family. This, uh, Next, there's, there's four clips in here. The first clip is of uh, when I was in Botswana. Um, the water in front of you is, is a bridge. Seriously, that's called the, I believe it's the second bridge down on the Okavanga Delta. And then there's going to be three, this blends in with three short clips of elephants. 
just gives you a feel for some of the things that you can do. So hang on, we're going to go for a bumpy ride. That's part of that's the maybe. Hang on to my suitcase. Me, me. So all those were shot with a Nikon uh, D750. Um, I think it was a 28300 lens, and uh, just shows what you can do with, uh, you know, with uh, with DSLRs. This uh, next, uh, there's going to be it's a kind of a uh, it's a group of clips uh, put together. Um, this past Christmas, I. Uh, did a video at our church, Capitol Drive Lutheran Church, and this was shot with um, two Nikon uh, mirrorless cameras in the Z series. Um, one was mounted on a tripod, so that one was fixed during the whole thing, and then the second one was on a tripod, and I was uh, manipulating that uh, depending upon how the service was going. So this just shows what uh, some of the things you can do with uh, mirrorless cameras. The 25th day of December, when ages beyond number had run their course from the creation of the world, a reading from the prophet Isaiah, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the second chapter, Genesis, through to Revelation, to now. Let us pray. Gracious God, your word made flesh brings harmony to the earth. So um, that was shot in relatively low light. I mean, that was around ISO uh, 10,000, somewhere in there. So um, just gives you a feel for some of the capability of... Uh, today's cameras. Um, Were you using the camera's microphone? Oh no, thanks, good question. I was actually using the, uh, the, the soundtrack was off of the soundboard. So there were two microphones, one at the pulpit, and then there was a portable mic that the pastor uh, had wired, was wired to. So all those fed into a uh, soundboard. And so then I took the video, I'm sorry, I took the audio off of that and then uh, merged it with the two video tracks, um, in, you know, in the, in the editor. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't get uh, sound nearly that good using uh, microphone cameras, uh, using camera, uh, microphones on the camera. At least nothing that I've been able to do. So why use uh, an interchangeable lens camera for Videos, well, the first thing is just the quality. You know, we invest a lot in these in these uh, cameras. The lenses, they're sharp. Low light capability is just uh, pretty amazing. You've got the image stabilization. Um, there's just so many features you've got. I mean, it's you want to use the whatever you've got with you. Uh, but if you're out shooting somewhere with your um, mirrorless camera, your DSLR, you know, it's so easy to switch from stills into video, and we're going to talk about how to do that in just a little bit. So what are the advantages of shooting videos? Some of this is pretty clear, but kind of intuitive, but certainly you add the motion and the sound. Um, that uh, 
each of those, you know, has the audio has something that really is important uh, to what was going on. To have a still by itself of my mother telling a laughing, you know, would be really nothing. Uh, I think there is great for nature, uh, for children. You know, if you've got kids, grandchildren, um, back in the late eighties, nineties, when the, uh, Sony uh, camcorder came out, the eight millimeter, I did, uh, that's when I first got into really shooting videos. My, my sister was in the area, had her children. And so with the children, there were just tons of, uh, subjects to shoot. The disadvantages, sure, there are some, they're more complicated, uh, time consuming to edit, to render and share. Uh, the files are larger. Um, so they, you just can't, uh, email these from, you know, one person to another. You can email links easily, but, uh, some of the challenges, it's just anticipating what's a video thinking maybe a little bit ahead of time. I'm going to this scene, maybe I'm going to be with some children. And uh, not only do some stills, but do some videos, videos as well. And just remembering to do it. And that is the problem that I've got. Sometimes, you know, lately I was out with Ken uh, uh, in the Badlands and uh, some other places where, around wildlife. And I would see Ken shooting video. And then we a reminder for me to shoot video too. And, uh, but uh, sometimes go into a, into a scene and... Uh, and I, you know, just instinctively, I'll start shooting stills, but uh, think about doing videos as well. You know, when 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 the situation calls for it. But it's uh, if it's if there's a lot of action, if there's life, if there's sound to it, um, it's just you know irreplaceable. So some of your basic considerations: um, being a mirrorless or a DSLR, both work. I, Showed you examples of both uh, the 750 and then the Nikon mirrorless cameras. The advantages um, for mirrorless, the viewfinder is enabled. And I really love that. Uh, for the DSLR, you know, when you go mirror up, um, it's going to block the, uh, the viewfinder. And I just find for certain things that, uh, especially for wildlife, to be able to use the viewfinder is a big advantage as opposed to holding the uh, camera away from you and looking, shooting off of the LCD screen and back. It's possible, you can do some great stuff, but I just find that as an, as an advantage. And, you know, as time goes on with the newer cameras, the image stabilization is getting better and better. Um, it um, just depends upon the model, but uh, some of these cameras just have great image stabilization. Which, which helps not only the stills, but your video as well. Um, what lenses to use? Hey, it depends upon the scene. Um, generally, I think a zoom lens is best. Um, just gives you a lot more variety as things are changing. Uh, audio quality. Um, camera might be good enough. Um, I've done a lot of work with the uh, camera uh, microphone. But, um, you know, there are external microphones available. They're not too expensive. You can get them from B&H or anybody. But you can easily add one of those uh, to your camera as well. I really don't have, I have never done that. But I certainly have seen that done. And a lot of people do that. And that's handheld versus tripod. Um, normally for most work, you know, you're going to be doing it handheld. It's just so much easier. You know, you're out. In the Badlands, uh, you know, we'd be out shooting and suddenly you see uh, some animal come along and, uh, you know, you're going to do that handheld. Uh, for more formal scenes like the church, uh, that uh, certainly I was on a tripod with both cameras. And uh, you definitely want to use a video uh, a head with that, a video head that gives you both pan and uh, what's the other one? I forgot now. But basically give you that two axis control your uh my, my the, i tried doing a little videography at church with uh, the old uh head that i used with my camera for stills and it just uh didn't work but uh there, there you can get a decent uh video uh head you know for under a hundred dollars certainly you can spend a lot more but uh 
And one consideration, usually this isn't a big one uh, for, for informal shooting, but it's you're limited on most cameras to 29 minutes. Well, the Z9 has blown that away. And, uh, but that was a consideration when I was shooting at church. So I had to be careful and I would uh, stop one of the cameras before 29 minutes restart it. And between the two cameras, I could then overlap and sequence and things just worked out fine then. So basic settings. Um, a lot of this is similar to what you do in stills. But um, first of all, you want to set your uh, stills video switch. I've got a picture of a Nikon camera here, but every camera is going to be different. But there's always a stills video switch. And for Nikon, it's right here. And so you want to set it down to video. Mode, if you're just getting going, just starting out, uh, you know, just you go into auto. That's the easiest thing, especially if you got your camera set up uh, to do uh, some stills. Um, just go into the auto mode. It's just the easiest thing to do. That, that's going to then shoot, shoot at uh, 1 30th of a second. And your f-stop is going to be lens dependent. Uh, you're not going to have any control over that. If you want to control the f-stop, I recommend then you go into the manual mode and you can do whatever you want, uh, lens dependent, of course. Uh, ISO, just go to auto. Image size. Um, the, the full HD 1920 by 1080 really works out great. Um, that's what I would shoot at church and put those up on on YouTube and uh, they would just be fine. Uh, SD, the one under it, it just doesn't have the uh, clarity that, that I would like. Frame rate, uh, 30 frames per second. Um, white balance, auto. Uh, auto. Normally, um, sometimes you get into complex lighting situations. You want to calibrate the camera. Like at church, I would add, the lighting there was just so complex between the outside light and the, the uh, ceiling lights. And I would uh, color calibrate uh, the camera for white balance. Metering, go to matrix. Now, when you go into the uh, autofocus, where there's, I don't know, it depends upon the camera. Um, these are terms that uh, Nikon uses, but uh, if you've got it, you know, go into the auto area, AF. Uh, if you've got people, the uh, newer Nikon mirrorless cameras, you can now choose face priority for people. There's I an, uh, high priority for animals, and uh, it's just going on and on. But and then focus mode, uh, full time autofocus. Um, it took me a while to learn to use these, but once I did, especially in the church setting, it was amazing. You just lock on in the beginning, and as people move around, it's just the focus just stays on the, on their eye. And uh, for the audio, uh, just you know use use auto. So those are your basic settings that that I've learned and uh, I think a lot of people as I read books would tend to agree. Um, this just is what the Nikon Z series cameras have for setting the picture control, but it's gonna depend upon your camera. So you wanna get ready to shoot. Um, okay, just again, make sure you're on video down here. Verify those video settings that we were talking about before. Make sure your image stabilization is on, be it the lens and or the camera, it depends on what you've got. Uh, some, uh, uh, depends upon the, you know, what, usually the, D, the DSLR world, it was the image stabilization was in the uh, lens uh, with the uh, mirrorless cameras. It's often in the camera, though I think if I remember, Canon still does their image stabilization in the lens, not sure about that. So just make sure you're in the auto mode that we talked about before. Uh, background distractions, well, good luck on that. It just depends. You know, if you're doing video, if it's kids, you want to capture something quick, um, you know, you're probably going to, you're just going to get what's there. You may or may not have control over it. And in the end, you know, if it's, you know, somebody talking a certain way, um, you tend to focus on the person when you watch it. I know that thing with my mother. 
Um, there were kids talking in the background. They were moving around. <laughs> there were all kinds of distractions, but still, you know, my mother's uh, laugh telling that story was, uh, was just stood out in my mind at least. So just make sure, check your light settings, uh, either off the histogram or the meter, and uh, just try to minimize your shaking as much as possible. Um, you know, when you're up close, uh, it's not that critical. If you're far away, uh, thinking back uh, to when I was shooting some wildlife, some birds, um, you know, I'm out at uh, six, 700 millimeters. That's pretty tough. Uh, so then I look for some, some way to stabilize myself, maybe lean up against the car. Uh, just find something to prop yourself on as you get further out. Um, scene composition, you know, it could be wide, it could be close, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, that's very similar to what, you're, what you would do in your stills. So here again, scene composition. Uh, in this case, I'm in close to my mother. Trying to block out everybody, all the other distractions around there. Scene composition here. I mean, with these alleys, uh, getting them together in larger groups, moving around here. What was cool in this one was the uh, after a little while, the uh, the youngster came out and was playing around with his trunk a little bit. And here we were watching in tight on this alley, doing some eating and uh, just focusing on. On that particular behavior. Scene composition here uh, at church. Certainly I wanted uh, at some point to uh, capture the whole setting with the Christmas decorations. Um, when the, the when a speaker would be up at the uh, lectern, the altar, I'm sorry, the uh, lectern or the pulpit, um, you know, it would tend to get in fairly tight on, on that person. Uh, sometimes you do want to take advantage of uh, what's around the person. So here with the uh, pastor at the communion table, taking all that into account, I think adds to the scene. Here, this uh, here you don't want to get too too close. This, in this case, the pastor tends to move around a lot. He would be going to the left side or the right side, and so you just got to open it up and make sure you get it all as best you can. So we're talking about we talked about. Uh, Prep, preparing to shoot, and now you want to shoot. So uh, your DSLR <coughs> on the DSLR, you want to press the live view button, whatever it is, uh, equivalent of that on your camera to basically raise the mirror up. You need to get the mirror out of the way. And then you compose, as we talked about. And then no matter what the brand camera is, I think it's universal, this little red button up on top that you press to start the video. Then you watch your scene using either the LCD screen in back uh, or the viewfinder on mirrorless cameras. and Just uh, go with the flow and see what's happening and uh, try to capture it. You know, people moving around. Maybe you want to, maybe you start out zooming in, maybe you want to zoom out and, uh, you know, just take, take advantage of what's going on. Uh, have some fun with it and, uh, and uh, to stop that particular video clip, you just press that red video button a second time. So, um, once you've got your videos, um, process them. <coughs> There's some simple ways to do that, but we're going to get into a couple of editors that you might have in a few moments. But the basic process steps are: you know, open your editor, import your file. Create your video using edit tools, and then back up your work often. You know, it's, it's, it's very often you may have little clips, and they may be good in and of themselves. And that's great. The more you have of that, and you can just, uh, you know, take it out of the memory stick and uh, put it up on the web somewhere, share it, or show somebody using the back of the camera. But... Um, I mean, keep it simple as possible. Um, render the video. That's where you uh, basically take all the work you've done and you export it. Uh, same as in a, you know, if you're in Photoshop, you know, you're working on a still and you do all kinds of editing and then you uh, export it to save all those changes. 
Um, editors uh, do allow you, most of them allow you to save a JPEG. Uh, you might want that. And you can share it uh, using all kinds of choices here. We're running out of time, I can see. Um, there's a number of different programs for editing. Um, just going to show you a couple of those. If you use Lightroom, you go into the library mode, and uh, there's some simple controls down here where you can uh, clip the beginning, clip the end, and then you've got controls up here for white balance and tone control. Photoshop, you can process. You can go into the motion workspace. You choose the workspace up in this area. Uh, you can edit uh, elements in the timeline down below. And then what's cool in Photoshop is really you have access to all the edit tools, you know, be it on this side, most of them anyway, that make sense. You can crop, you can change the tones, the, the white balance, almost anything you're used to doing for editing a still, you can do on the video. Then you render it to the MP4. Uh, Brian. Um, there's a couple other editors out there. Gab? Hey, Brian. Yeah. Uh, can we wrap this up next month? Uh, we've got our guests uh, waiting in the sidelines here. I'm at the last slide right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's some resources. So just, that's all for us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jeff, is our guest online yet? I certainly am. Ah, welcome. Thank uh, you. Liz, I could spend a few minutes and introduce you. Uh, I read some of your bio here. Uh, would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about yourself and then take it away? Well, why don't I think it's better if you just read some of what you have in front of you. Okay, let I'll, me pull it up. I'll fill in any gaps. All right, so Lewis has a camera in his hand since he was age 14. That kind of, that's about when I picked mine up. Inspired by his father, he began to explore photography more seriously in high school with a dark room in the basement. Fast forward many years in his life in Baltimore and his joining the Baltimore Camera Club. Further inspired by his um, peers, Lewis became an award-winning photographer a photography teacher. He currently teaches at John Hopkins University, the Community College of Baltimore County, Capital Photo Photography Center out of DC, as well as the Baltimore Camera Club. He lives, he lives for the aha moment, which only teaches, which only teaching can provide. Well, Lewis, I hope you get the aha tonight. <laughs> uh, welcome, and uh, uh, we welcome what you have to say about your program. I think it's going to be fantastic. I love the title of it. Okay. Um, please take it away. Okay. Thank, well, you, sir. thank you, first of all, for inviting me to talk to your uh, group. Um, I'm coming to you from Baltimore, Maryland. So the magic of Zoom has uh, been one of the nice things that we've sort of discovered through this horrendous last couple of years that we've spent. Um, I'll just fill in a couple of gaps, I guess. I, I was, I started shooting at 14. Um, I went, I grew up in New York City and I was lucky enough to go to a high school that had photography as an elect, some elective courses. So I took some courses in photography and I set up a little dark room in my basement. And of course, back then I was only doing black and white because we weren't doing any developing of color. And um, yeah, it's fast. It really is a fast forward to many years. Um, I had a career in the travel industry which lent itself to photography as well. And so for a long, long time, all I really was was a color slide photographer. Um, and I've been a member of the Baltimore Camera Club for 20, about 21, 22 years. Uh, the Baltimore Camera Club anecdotally is the oldest continually operating camera club in the United States. We have archives that go back to about the 1885s. So we've been around for a long time. Um, and what this program is about 
It's basically called Perspective and Perception, the Myth of Style. And what I want to say about that before I share my screen is that um, you as the photographer bring the perspective that you want to bring to the image that you are creating. And it's all dependent on, of course, where you stand, your position to the subject matter, your feelings about the subject matter. And the perception part is what your viewer then ends up receiving on the receiving end, how they actually perceive the image. And the second part, the myth of style, refers to the fact that when I first joined the camera club, I met people and photographers that really kind of blew my mind in terms of their talent, um, in terms of where they were at compared to where I thought I was at. And so for the first year or so, I tried to emulate some other people's styles because I liked the way their photos looked. And that, it took me over a little over a year to realize that that was really a big mistake. Um, you shouldn't really chase anyone else's style. You really need to develop sort of your own, um, you don't even have to develop your own style because as, as you look at my images tonight, you're gonna see that I don't use any one particular style um, of photography that I, it all depends on, you know, sort of what I'm, what I'm actually shooting. So based on that, I can now do a little share screen action here. And someone just needs to verify that they can see my Lightroom screen. Can you, is my title page showing up? Yes, it yes. is. Yes. Okay, great. So now I can just minimize everybody. All right. So as I said, the name of the program is Perspective and Perception, the Myth of Style. There's my website address. Um, I was lucky enough to get my own name when I went out to buy it, I guess about eight or nine years ago. So it's just lewiscatsphotography.com. And that email address is only used for photography. So that separates it out from all of our other stuff that we get at home. So if you want to contact me about the seminar um, or about anything that we don't cover or any questions that you might have, that would be the Olympus 21209 at yahoo.com. And the final comment I'll make is that I passed your, um, I passed to Jeffrey a copy of a survey monkey survey, which he is going to give out after the program is over. That's how I get feedback. You know, I'm used to standing in front of a classroom like at Hopkins um, and getting immediate feedback from my students. Um, I have found that doing these survey monkeys is the best way for me to get feedback from all these different people at all the different camera clubs that I've been talking to. And it only takes two seconds. It's five questions on a space for comments. So I really do appreciate getting those back. It's all anonymous. I'll know it's from your club, but I won't know who, from who, from whom it is from. So, um, at, you know, when Jeffrey does distribute that, I would really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to, um, to take your time and just, you know, and answer those questions. So with that, we're just gonna kind of jump right in. And sometimes it gets stuck on the first slide. So I'm gonna to move to the second one. Okay, so perception and perspective, the art of seeing. Um, this is just a quick chart. It reinforces, I think, a lot of things that we already know. Um, a, for me, is really big, really big picking a subject with emotional impact. And what I mean by that is you should have an emotional attachment of some variety to the subject matter that you're shooting. If you're a really big flower lover and you love shooting flowers, that love of your, uh, that you have is going to show. Um, when we go out and just shoot kind of blindly, um, we end up with images that really aren't that effective. So I'm really, really big on um, emotions and photography because it's one way that I get to express my emotions is through my photography. And then these are obvious, right? Use dynamic and fluid composition. I have some examples of all of these 
use balance in creating your compositions, use rhythm in creating your composition, and of course, use the proper lighting. Um, now, the second part of the chart is really more coming from neuroscience than it is coming from other people's opinions. You know, um, with the advances that we've made in neuroscience, scientists can now study the brain and as people perceive art. And these are some of the things that have come out of those studies. Um, people tend to look at larger elements before smaller ones. They like brighter rather than darker. They like warmer colors before cool colors. They like things obviously that are in focus before blurry ones. High contrast seems to be very attractive to people. People are attracted to oblique lines like curves and diagonals before straight ones. We seem to like having human and animal elements in our, in our pictures. Um, and the element should be in perspective, which I'll get into actually is the first thing I get into. And then we do like isolated elements before cluttered. And that's of course something that I teach all my beginning photography. I don't, I don't mean young, I mean beginning photographers is to, is that old acronym of keep it simple, stupid. Um, because the simpler you're able to create your image, the more easily you're able to translate what you're trying to say with your image to, to your viewer. So this is just kind of a, a, a little chart before we get into the image part, portion. So how do you create perspective and how do you create depth? Um, we are trying to turn a 2D medium into a 3D viewing experience. And one way that I have found particularly effective is to get very low down on your subject matter, which is going to emphasize that vanishing point. For instance, this is on the Eastern shore of Maryland. I was by those silos and I was watching them fill the, the truck, which was really kind of interesting. And I got some good shots of that, but I purposely walked a good like quarter of a mile away from the scene and got low down and shot using a wider angle, which gave me a much better perspective on the scene. It has a very nice vanishing point, which you're gonna hear me mention many times in, in this presentation, and that the railroad tracks sort of just vanish into the background. I like the repetitive telephone poles on the right. I like all the farm buildings on the left. And you can still very clearly see that the truck is being filled um, with the silo. So it's a way of creating more interesting um, photographs. And I have a couple of other examples. Here's a, a, um, a metal railroad bridge up in York, Pennsylvania, about an hour from Baltimore. Same kind of thing. Um, I love the bridge. I love the way it was structured. But to bring depth and perspective into the picture, I just got low down on the scene and shot the rails as they went, as they snaked their way over the, this little creek. And then they sort of take a little bit of a left turn and they sort of vanish. And that's again, creating that vanishing point. And whenever you can create that, you're gonna create that perspective and that depth in your pictures, which people seem to really appreciate um, as viewers. And here's another example. We actually still have freight lines that run through South Baltimore. And these are the CSX tracks that they run on. And I'm using that same exact kind of um, method. I'm getting low down on the curvature of the railroad track. And I'm just pulling your eye right down through the center of the shot. The vanishing point is where the tracks disappear. I wanted to get the lights in above the rails. And I wanted to get those railroad buildings in that are off to the right-hand side. So same kind of idea, just building depth and perspective um, in your pictures. And here's some examples. Here's an example where it's being created for me naturally. So it's not only man-made. This is a river that's about a half hour north of Baltimore called the Gunpowder River. And I'm taking this off the left-hand bank 
and I have these beautiful rocks in the foreground with all the lichen growing, but I have this beautiful scene in front of me with the river stretching out to infinity. And what's also really cool is that the bottom part of the picture, the white balance is very cool. And uh, as the image proceeds, the white balance actually gets warmer and warmer because that's where the sun is starting to peek through. So again, here I am using a natural element, but I'm still trying to create that perspective and that sense of depth um, by basically including more information uh, in, in the image, but yet it's still a very simple image and a very simple composition. Here's an example that I shot in Manhattan. Um, here was an example where another thing that a photographer needs to have is patience. Because I found the backdrop before that person was there. What, and what I mean by that is I found the scene. The scene was those two metal fences, which I just loved. The light poles, the trees coming in from the right. And that's, that, that's an abandoned Con Edison power plant in the background that sat that used to sit on an island in the East River. I think it's since been abandoned. I mean, totally raised. You never could get on the island anyway. So it was always very frustrating, but it was a great background, but I didn't have a person. I needed a person. And what I needed then is patience because I noticed that there was a stairway coming up from the left. And even though I was in a sort of remote part of town, I knew that within a few minutes, someone would come up those stairs. And certainly within about five or 10 minutes, this gentleman came up those stairs. He could, there's no way he could have walked the other way. He had to walk toward me. And so as soon as he started walking toward me, I started shooting and this was just the one that I picked the best. But that human element added to the scene really adds a, a vulnerability and a, um, a different feeling to the to the image than it would have been if it just would have been the backdrop. Sometimes you find a great backdrop, you just need to be patient and wait for something to happen. Here's another example. I'm in, uh, actually I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in an area of Brooklyn called Dumbo, which stands for down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. And that's the Brooklyn Bridge uh, that you see in the background. And, you know, I wasn't going to try and emulate Margaret Bork White or any of the other famous great photographers that shot the Brooklyn Bridge so amazingly. So I purposely, again, backed up off of where the bridge actually was. And I'm using the different elements in the image to draw your eye to the one span of the bridge, you know, the warehouse, the cobblestone street, and actually on those on the on that cobblestone street, those are old trolley tracks that probably, you know, were put in in, in the early 1900s, and they just never bothered to sort of take them out. They're obviously not used anymore. But I'm using all of those things as leading lines that just lead you to what I want you to, to see, which is that one span of the, of the Brooklyn Bridge. So again, I'm using my vantage point to create a perspective and that perspective is gonna create a certain perception in the way that the viewer sees um, the image. Here's another one done naturally. This one actually was done this fall. We, the club, we normally do two weekend trips a year, which of course we haven't done. But this past fall, there was a little bit of a break on the East Coast with COVID. And we decided to take a quick dash down to a very, one of our fam favorite spots in West Virginia, this little town called Davis, West Virginia. And I'm on a bridge overlooking this river and I just see this solitary rock just sort of staring at me. And I'm focusing in on the rock, but I'm purposely including the rest of the scene to build that perspective and that, um, that depth. And the vanishing point in this one is where the river takes a slight bend to the right and then it just disappears into the, into the mountains. Scale is another thing to, to, to play with. I love creating images that play with people's minds because if, you're, if you create an image that's playing with someone's mind and getting them to think, 
that's about 80% of the battle. And so with scale, what you can play with is how people are perceiving this. There's really no way to know how large that piece of driftwood is and how large that piece of sandstone is that it's sitting on top of. And it's all the way, that's all due to the way that the image was actually perceived by me and then actually taken. Um, and scale is another really fun thing to play with. Here's another good example. I'm on a workshop. Some, they're all, people are sitting on the beach. They're waiting for the sun to go down to get sunset. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to just stand here. And, you know, so I decided to take a walk. And I was, you know, that old expression about looking up and looking down. This was a perfect example. I looked down and I saw this beautiful weed just growing out of the sand. I didn't add any of the sand to this. This is exactly what it looked like. But again, I'm playing with your brain because you don't really have any sense of how large that weed is and how large the beach is that I'm walking on. So I really love creating images that make you think um, and make you wonder about what's happening you know, in the image. Here's another example of, of scale and perspective. What I'm doing here is I'm lying flat on my back and I'm shooting straight up at these grain silos. And these may have been the same silos that were in that first image. Um, but by shooting it the way that I did, when I looked at this on the computer, to me, they kind of look more like rocket silos than they did grain silos. And those stanchions looked like, you know, the, 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 the the things that are holding the, the rocket back, you know, and that when the rocket takes off, those things sort of fall away. So I'm, I'm creating a completely different view of these grain silos by just changing my perspective. Um, and again, the way I'm doing it in this case is I'm literally lying just flat on my back with my wide angle lens and I'm just shooting straight up at the, um, at the silos. Uh, here's another example of playing with scale. Uh, we used to get bigger snowstorms in Baltimore. Uh, we don't really get much snow the last four or five years. We get a little, but not a lot. But I was out shoveling one day, and as I walked back to the house, I noticed the scene, and I said to myself, well, as soon as I'm done, I'm coming out here with my camera. And again, I'm playing with scale, and what I'm simply shooting here is snow that's piled up in the crotch of our triple trunk ash tree that's in the backyard. Um, but by getting really close and by using a wide angle lens and a vertical perspective, and you're gonna notice that I shoot a lot of verticals versus horizontals, um, I'm just playing with scale because I've gotten so many different reactions from people as to what they think this is. And I would say half the people get it right away, but about half the people really sort of struggle with trying to figure out what this really is. Is it a canyon? Is it a, you know, what is it? Um, is it a gorge? But, you know, right, you know, a lot of people right away see it as what it is. It's just, that's the bark of the tree and that's just snow that's gathered in the, uh, in the crotch of the tree. But again, I like, I like creating images that play with people's brains. Rhythm is another really important thing uh, to include in your images. And I have had two conversations with people that used to be jazz music musicians that became photographers. And those conversations were really enlightening to me because for me, I was struggling with seeing how to create rhythm in photographs, but after those conversations and practicing for a bit and finding the right subject matter, I actually found it pretty easy to start creating images that actually have a beat. If you want to actually think of it, you know, rhythm is sort of like a beat. Um, and here's, you know, this is an image of an apple orchard, which is now unfortunately gone because the farmer decided it was more profitable to, to cramp, uh, to plant crops. Um, but I was able to get a nice vantage point because I'm on a little knoll and I'm overlooking these budding apple trees. But the way that the trees are interspersed and the way that they're interacting with each other, this image has sort of a natural rhythm to it. And once you start seeing those rhythmic 
things in your composition, you will begin to appreciate how important they are uh, to incorporate them. You know, here's another example. This is actually out uh, at a botanical garden down in Sarasota, Florida. And this is an, an enormous banyan tree. And there was no way that I was gonna try and even capture the enormity of the tree vertically. It would, it would have been almost impossible. So then it became, well, what part of this tree do I really focus on? What really interests me? And the lower down I got, the better feeling I got and the better feeling of rhythm and beat that I got. And so here's just the very bottom of the, of the banyan tree all of those are roots, the big curved items are roots. And of course, then they're sending out these little spindles um, that then become the bigger root structure. And, you know, when compositions really start working well, when you are able to combine these various elements into a single composition. And that's what we as photographers, I think, are all striving for. We want our images to be well composed, balanced, to have rhythm, to have something of interest in them. And when all of those elements work together, that's when you really start coming up with higher quality images. I, I grew up in New York City. I left when I was 17 and a half to go to college. I never lived there again full time, but I was a New York City subway rider for many years. I took a bus and two subway trains to get from Queens to Manhattan to go to high school. Now, this obviously wasn't taken back then. This was taken, I would think, four or five years ago. But I'm on a New York City subway train. I'm leaned up against the door. And I've seen just about every subway picture imaginable, right? Uh, people leaning up against the side, people sleeping, homeless people, policemen leaning up against one of the doors. But in this particular case, I looked up and I saw these hands that were grasping this handrail. And I said, well, wow, that's a shot I've never seen before. And so that led me to create this image. And not only is it an interesting New York City subway image, but again, it has a really nice natural beat to it, the way the hands are interspersed. And I purposely focused on that woman's hand to the right and used a low aperture and that purposely made the other hand sort of fall out of focus. And to this day, you know, this is the only type of, the only type of sub New York subway picture like this that I've ever really seen um, that anyone else has taken. And of course, that's the other thing we're always going for, right? Is to be unique, is to create, again, don't chase someone else's style, see what you can, find and create on your own. Uh, we have roller derby in Baltimore. We will have roller derby back in Baltimore after, uh, I think it'll come back this summer, actually. It's all women's roller derby. It's not the same roller derby that I used to watch growing up as a kid on, in New York. It's much less rough than it used to be, but it's still a contact sport, as you can see from all the padding that they're wearing. And all I'm really trying to do in this instance is get a feeling of the motion of, of these two teams that are playing against each other. And it was also really important for me to get that referee standing in the background with the striped shirt on because he's the guy calling all the penalties and all the fouls. And I purposely left out all details of the bodies. I really just focused purely on the legs and, and, the, uh, and the feet and the skates. And as you can see, some are moving, some are static. It just has a really nice feeling of rhythm and movement um, to it. Speaking about simple balanced compositions, um, this is when we used to get bigger snows in Baltimore. This, I am borrowing a little bit from someone that I do really like, a photographer named Harry Callahan. Um, all I noticed when I came out was these branches sticking out of the snow. And it was only maybe about six inches of snow. So it was very important to compose this in a way that made for a uniform and unified composition. 
And so I started with those bigger branches on the left, on the right, and then I just sort of worked my way. And every branch that you can see in this image actually is somewhat important in the overall composition. And I also love the way that the snow turned out. It looks like the moguls that they were skiing, you know, in the Olympics. So again, I'm really big on very, very simple, but balanced um, compositions. So here's a, I'm gonna show you two examples. What first grabbed my eye was this beautiful hay bale. Um, and it's actually on my way to that river that I shoot a lot called the Gunpowder River. And, you know, this scene is rather static though, because it's, it's very left heavy. You know, I can, you can see great detail in the hay bale and I've got a great sky going, but there's nothing really else going on. But what really was out, what else was really going on was that there was more subject matter to include. And once I realized that, it became a much more unified and a better composition. And even though you're, even though you can't see the diagonal lines that are creating a triangle in this image, there is clearly a triangle that runs from this bigger hay bale to this one, to the tree. The tree is a really important element in this image. And then your eye goes to this hay bale in the back and then it comes right back to this one. And that's where you get that magic triangle of composition because triangles in photographic compositions are really important uh, in terms of leading your viewer's eyes through the image. Excuse me, I take a sip of coffee every few minutes. So this is, you know, I went from there to there and it's just a huge difference in the way the image is perceived by the viewer and it's all because all I really did was probably widen my lens a little bit and maybe took a couple of steps back and was able to include so much more subject matter. Uh, here I am at Great Sand Dunes National Monument. I think it's a national park now. This is the one that's in Southeast Colorado. Um, it's not a night shot, but I purposely darkened the sky I wanted the sky to kind of match the darkened colored of the dunes on the right hand side. And on the day that I was there, it was particularly windy and I was getting these really nice gusts that were picking up the, the sand. And so I waited for a nice one to come and I got the shot of the, the wind picking that top of the sand up, up off the dune. But again, as you look through the image from right to left, you really get a really nice sense of balance and composition and rhythm in the way that these dunes are sort of just laid out naturally, um, you know, by nature and the wind, um, because the wind is constantly moving and shifting these dunes into different forms and different shapes. Uh, sometimes you get lucky in that we rented a vacation house a, year, a few years back in Maine and we were right on a pond and I walked to the end of the pier and I sat down and I looked down and this is exactly what I saw just sitting on at the edge of the of the pier. I looked down and I saw this gorgeous composition of fall leaves that had just fallen just the way that you see them the sticks, I like the sticks. They don't sort of bisect the image, but they sort of add an element of interest to it. Um, you can see how clear the water is because you can see the bottom of the, um, of the pond really clearly. And I really didn't have to do very much to this in terms of uh, post-processing because it just sort of presented itself to me already sort of well composed and well laid out. And so sometimes you just sort of get lucky in that you look down at something and it's like, wow, I really like the way that looks. Uh, before moving to Baltimore, I lived about 40 minutes north of the city and commuted. And I lived in a very rural part of Southern York County, Pennsylvania. Um, and I rented an old farmhouse that was on about 140 acres of land. And that's not where this is, but that's just to give you a little background. 
So when we do get some weather, like snow or fog or ice, I tend, if I don't want to shoot an urban environment, I tend to head up to the area that I used to live in. And I will also stress that once you find an area that you like to shoot in because of your emotional attachment to the area, you should continually go back to that same area, you know, more than two or three times a year, because the more you visit a specific area or place, the stronger your emotional connection to that place will become. And that, that's what's gonna raise the quality of your images. Now in this image, I really wanted to shoot the horses, but that horse on the left, right over here, this guy, he wasn't in the picture. So right now, think of this picture as just being bisected like right there. And it really wasn't working as composition. It was just too right heavy. There was just too much going on on the right. And there wasn't anything going on on the left. So once again, patience was required because there were horses over here. And I just knew that if I was patient, one or two would walk over. And sure enough, within a few minutes, that one horse walked over and stuck his nuzzle in the snow to try and get some grass from underneath the snow. And as he picked his head up is when I clicked the shutter. And that horse is absolutely critically important to the rest of the composition uh, because he balances out the rest of the, of the composition with the rest of the horses and then the trees and, and a nice little stormy sky in the background. So when you find a great scene, but it's missing something, if you can figure out what it's missing and that missing thing can be put in, and I don't mean artificially, I mean naturally, you know, sometimes just some patience is required, you know, for, for it to happen. So here's a barn in West Virginia. We were at the same exact spot the year before, and that barn was in horrible shape. It was totally left to ruin. It was like abandoned and the timbers were falling in and it just, it was in horrible shape. And so on that trip, we of course, being lovers of abandoned things, we really focused our attention on the barn itself because it just had so many interesting things going on. We came back the next year and someone had miraculously fixed the barn up and painted it. So now the barn wasn't so interesting anymore. So I had to rethink about, well, what do I now want to do with this composition? And so what I did was I walked around to the other side of the pond. And as soon as I looked through my viewfinder and noticed that the reflections of the mountains and the mountains themselves formed sort of a torso shaped um, situation, I knew that I had found my composition. And the barn is still an important part of the composition, but there's many other aspects of this composition that are very important. You can tell it's fall from just looking at the leaves on the right-hand side. They're all gold and red. Um, but again, you have to sometimes rethink you know, something that you've seen before, because we were all expecting to go back and continue shooting this abandoned barn, and this is instead what we found. But uh, it was a lucky find for me because I think this turned into a, actually a much stronger um, composition. So this is actually at the Amtrak station in Baltimore, which is called Penn Station. It's actually one of my favorite places to shoot because I love the architectural details. It's a, it's a very old building. Um, and I'm including this picture just to show again how I worked to balance the composition. Um, obviously, as I walked by the door, I saw the gentleman sitting on the bench. He's probably on his phone, which is unfortunately what we as street photographers have to deal with these days. Everyone knows on their phone. But I like the way that I could, could, that I could compose the image by shooting it vertically, making him the center of attention, but yet still keeping in 
that really nice sconce on the right hand wall, the stained glass sign offices. Um, even that mat on the floor is sort of like a leading line that then leads you into this column of light that then leads you right to where I want you to look at, which is the gentleman right there. So again, it's just a, a, an example of how to sort of create depth and perspective because there's definitely some nice depth in this picture. Um, and it's also a way of making sure that you're creating really nice balanced compositions. Uh, this is actually at Gettysburg. And again, I live pretty close to Gettysburg. It's about an hour and 15 minutes away. But I find it to be a very, very frustrating place to come back with good images from. And one of the reasons is because it's so busy. And when I say busy, I don't mean with people. I mean with monuments and signs. And they're all important to the history of why we enshrine this ground. So I'm not making any pejorative statements about the Park Service. But getting good images becomes difficult because it's hard to find a way to not include too many of those. But this was one image that I was very happy with. What I first noticed was this beautiful sweeping picket fence, which I just really, really loved. And so I made this guy on the right, the anchor position, and your eye then sweeps down right through the fence. It then lights on this darker piece of shrubbery. It then moves up to the tree line and it follows the tree line to these two barns and it continues following the tree line. And there's the one monument that's in this picture. There's a gentleman on a horse right there. And then your eye continues on to the other pieces of dark shrubbery and it leads you right back to the center right there. And so I've created a really nice circular composition. Um, and along with triangles, circular compositions are really excellent because they keep your viewer's eyes on your image longer than they might someone else's images who may not um, have used such a strong composition. So we've all shot waterfalls. We've all seen waterfalls. Um, we're all familiar with the cotton candy effect and neutral density filters and two second exposures and 20 second exposures. And I've done a lot of that work and I still enjoy doing that work. But here was an opportunity because a friend of mine and I recently were driving around rural Maryland and we actually came across a small waterfall, maybe about 30 feet wide. Um, and it was on somebody's property, so we were probably trespassing a little bit. And that's an ethical line that each photographer has to decide whether they're going to cross. But the nice thing about this waterfall was that I was literally able to sit down right at the edge of the waterfall. And instead of doing a typical waterfall picture, I concentrated on shooting the top of the falls. And I loved these abstract reflections that I was getting. These are trees that are just up here that are reflecting in the waterfall. And I'm also really loving these abstract patterns that I'm getting. And this is how you can tell it's a waterfall from that upper right hand corner. That's the actual piece of the falls. And the rest of the falls is all down here, where, which I've purposely blocked out. So this is a spot that I just recently found that I will go back to. I know I will go back to the spot because I just think every day you go and shoot these reflections, especially as the trees change, they're all gonna look different from each other. None of them will be identical. And I like images like that as well. I like images that constantly change. And so this was just a very interesting perspective on a waterfall, one that I had never really quite seen before because most of the waterfalls that we go to shoot are pretty vast and it's really hard to get a good shot of just the top. And also the water is normally running so fast that you can't concentrate on getting these individual abstractions. So when we found that we were both like really thrilled. 
but I do occasionally like abstract images. So here I am at the what's called the Oculus, which is the transit center that was built in lower Manhattan to replace the subway station that was destroyed in 9-11. And it's much more than a subway station because there's a lot of other trains that come into this. But um, we went down there to go to the museum, uh, which is a great, the 9-11 museum is well worth visiting next time you're in New York City. And then we walk next door to this building called the Oculus. And it's an amazing piece of architecture. You can actually see some of the ribs, and I'm gonna show you another picture in a second of how they actually built it. But when I looked up at the scene, I immediately saw the potential for a great abstract photograph. Um, I love these two arrows that are pointed against each other. I love the reflections of the ribs in the glass. I, I love the steam pipe that's kind of running through. And it just looked to me like, you know, and I don't do that much abstract photography because I find it actually rather difficult. But to me, this what this came out as a successful, you know, abstract shot. This is also the same building, but now I've got a different vantage point. I'm up on a balcony and I'm overlooking the floor of the transit center. And there, here you can see those ribs that were reflected in the in the glass. And this light is coming from a beautiful skylight that's on the top of the building. And I wanted to get a total scene. I wanted to get a scene that showed really the whole thing, or not the whole thing, but as much of it as I could. And it was very important for me to have people scattered about through the building. And I love these people sitting on these, they, they made these like lily pads that you can sit on and have a cup of coffee or have a conversation with somebody. So, but I wanted to even go one step further. And that's, and you can see these guys, they're right here. Those two guys sitting right there. I got myself to a different vantage point and put on a longer lens. And I just shot those two guys talking to each other because I wanted to get this beautiful detail of the light coming through the skylight but I wanted to include people in it because just the light itself, it may have just, it may have made for a semi-interesting abstract, but I don't really think it would have. And I think including the people in this image, including their shadows, especially, which remind me sort of like of Alfred Hitchcock shadows, um, it really made this picture come, come to life. Another great thing to do while you're in Manhattan is to walk what's called the High Line. The High Line was an elevated rail line that went to the meatpacking district. Um, and it used to be the trains that would come and pick up all the, or bring all the meat to the butchering houses that would then butcher the meat. The rail line was left to abandon probably in the 19, late 50s, early 60s. And someone had the foresight instead of just knocking it down, they actually turned it into a walking park. So you now can walk this two and a half mile stretch of the High Line, which is now planted with gorgeous plantings that has benches you can sit on. And because you're four or five stories above the ground, you get these very unique perspectives on Manhattan. And all this is is a reflection of the building across from where I'm standing that's being reflected in this building. And I'm getting all of these really interesting abstract shapes um, because, of the, um, because of the reflection. But I highly recommend it. Again, next time you're in New York, definitely take advantage of the High Line. Uh, in that same area, there's an area called Hudson Yards. Now, Hudson Yards was the last undeveloped piece of Manhattan that hadn't had office buildings or apartment buildings built. And some developer bought the entire tract and built office buildings and built apartments and built a mall. Um, it's not the most convenient place to live because you're nowhere near a subway station. But he also then hired an architect to, to build this thing, which they called the vessel. Um, and you have to pay a, a couple of bucks, or you had to when, when I was there, 
for the privilege of being able to walk up these stairs that's seven stories high. And you do get some kind of interesting views off these balconies, um, but there's a lot of things blocking your, your view. As a piece of architecture, I found it actually quite hideous. I really didn't think it mixed with the, uh, with the area at all. I, I just wasn't impressed with, 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 this, with this piece of architecture. Nor was I impressed with taking the images that I was getting from it. But I, I certainly needed to at least take a picture of it. And I, again, wanted to include some people because that gives you a sense of scale because this thing is pretty large. But then I noticed that the mall right across from me had glass, was all glass. And so I walked across the way and I started shooting these. And these came out so much more interesting. I just was leaning up against the wall, watching people as they reacted to looking through the glass at this piece of architecture. And this one just by far came out the best because I just love her bodily language. You know, her, her feet are somewhat crossed, her hands are, are astray, and you see a nice reflection of her. You know, this was brand new, so the mall was spotless, so all the floors were polished. And so I'm getting, you know, again, that depth and perspective, and I'm still getting a picture of the vessel, but I'm now creating a much more interesting picture by creating, by adding a silhouette of a human um, to the image. This is also from the High Line, and these are the kind of scenes that you can only get since you're three or four stories up. This is literally the space between two office buildings, and these are the different roofs of the, um, the building that connected the two. And to me, there's just so much movement and so much geometric shape in this shot. Um, which I never could have gotten otherwise. You have this beautiful, you know, this beautiful geometric grid right here. I love these semi-triangular tops to this, whatever. This, I'm not even sure what that is. It was like a little lobby area that was lit up. That was interesting. Here's the fence that's separating this building from behind, from this building ahead. But you can see straight through right to the other side. And so here I am creating that really nice depth and perspective of this scene, which is just the, the space that between two office towers. Um, and you can see the vents, you know, on the right hand side over here, uh, which I also like. So I just thought there was so much going on in this photograph. Uh, and yet it still came out as a really nice balanced rhythmic um, composition. changing locales completely. Again, I mentioned I was in the travel business. So on one of our trips to Paris, I looked, I stepped on my balcony and I looked out across the way. And this is exactly what I saw was this person, I think it's a woman smoking a cigarette, leaning her hand on the rail. And all you really see is the hand, the cigarette and the watch. And, you know, uh, there might have been some shadow detail that I could have brought out, but I really didn't want to bring any of that out. And it was also very important for me to include a piece of the Louvre, because to some people that have been to Paris, they recognize this as Paris right away. It was like, oh, that's in Paris. And that's because a lot of the buildings have these old wooden Louvres, as other countries do too. But again, since we're talking about perspective and perception, this was my way of just showing um, this kind of image from a totally kind of different perspective. And again, vantage point is so important because I had to be on equal planes with this hand, otherwise I'd either be looking up or looking down and it wouldn't nearly be as effective as it is looking straight across. Uh, I'm still in Lower Manhattan now, and but I'm in a different office building, and I have a different vantage point. I'm still on a balcony, and what I first noticed was what all what, was all these beautiful reflections of these wavy lines on the top of the glass roof, and they're picked up on this glass roof, and they're also picked up on this glass roof, and I like the texture and the 
the, the way the floor, the way the outside was delineated. But I wanted to include some people, so I purposely waited. This gentleman has already come through. This woman is about to go through this revolving door, and this person is about to enter. And then I purposely angled my camera, because if I, if I would have shot it straight on, I think it still would have been kind of static. And I, if there's... If these wavy lines produce anything, they produce motion and rhythm. And if I would have shot it straight on, it would have sort of nullified that feeling that you get of rhythm and movement from those, um, from those beautiful wavy lines that are being reflected in the roof. So we also love to shoot trees. And sometimes you get lucky um, again, if we have weather, I usually head up to the area that I used to live. And this is pretty much where this is almost, you know, very close to where I used to live in the country. And I went up one day, we had a snowstorm, and then we had a bit of an ice storm. And as soon as I heard that the highway had been cleared, I just hightailed it straight up 83, um, to this area, Southern York County, Pennsylvania. And I'm driving down roads that I'm familiar with, and I turn to my right, and I see these two trees. And these two trees, as far as I'm concerned, are dancing. There's just no other way to interpret this photo as two trees dancing. And the ice has formed these beautiful formations, um, giving them skirts and jewelry and blouses. And, and you know, it's a one-time shot because this... Well, first of all, this tree on the right, a year later, blew down. So that's now laying on the ground. But it's a one-time shot because meteorologically, I never would have been able to get this again. It never would have happened again. And so, you know, I pulled over and, you know, I had boots on and got myself into a good position and, and took some shots of these two trees. They're not connected at all. They just look connected. Uh, there's no actual physical connection between these two trees. They're not touching each other anywhere, um, but it looks like they are. So to me, these have always been dancing trees. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a really big fog roll in one Sunday afternoon. It had been a little rainy in the morning, um, but no one predicted that by like three o'clock in the afternoon, this big fog was going to roll in. And I'm looking out my living room window and I'm saying, oh, my God, look at this. It's, I can't see across the street. And so, again, I don't I can't travel real far because it's too late in the day. But I live in an area that's residential, but also has some areas that are forested that don't have any man-made objects. And so I immediately gravitated right to that area. And so this is a vertical shot of trees, which is certainly one way. And I think it's the way most people try and capture, you know, the verticality of trees. However, another really effective way to change people's perspective is to shoot them horizontally. And when I changed the horizontal format, I was able to concentrate much more on the, some of these very interesting details of the ivy climbing up the trees. And I was able to look for the tonality of the trees that I wanted to shoot because I, I had an area that was wide enough that I could have chosen four or five different compositions. And you can see how deep and dense the fog is. It's really deep. And these images only work if there's nothing man-made that you can see. If you could see a house through here or a car, it, it would totally take the perspective out of the picture. Um, and um, it is an area of just woods. So there, there, wouldn't, there, there wouldn't be any houses behind it anyway. I'm just sort of making that as a general you know, comment. So again, this is, this is, this is what it looked like vertically, which I, which I like but I really like the horizontal a lot more. I just think it's a far more interesting image than the, than the vertical image. But neither of them were still what I was hoping to get from being out in the fog. And I was still no more than five minutes from my house. And as I was driving home, I passed the park 
a park that we have. And when I saw this, I said, yup, that's the image that I was trying to find. I was trying to find the interrelation between these two trees in the fog. I darkened down the one in the front to give it a little more contrast. But you again can see how deep the fog is in the background because I didn't do anything to the background in post-processing. That's just how the fog actually looked. But I just love the way this tree in the front just pops out from the scene that's sort of behind it. Um, and once I got that one, then, I, then it was getting kind of dark. And so by that time, it was time to head home anyway. Another way, and we're talking about the myth of style, another way that I like to shoot trees is to make them look like Japanese woodcuts because I really like the art of Japanese and Chinese woodcut print art. I just have always been attracted to it. And so here's what I, I call these tree stands. It's just this, this row of trees with no, no man-made objects in them. And I purposely did convert this in a certain way in the digital darkroom to give it that sort of woodcut kind of look. Um, sharpening and texture and things like that really help you know an image give it a certain look and that's what I did with this one and what you're trying to do is again just find the most interesting cross section of the scene that's in front of you and I actually was a fair distance away from this tree stand um, and I just you know, had a, a longer lens out, you know, on the tripod and was just sort of looking, scanning to see where the most interesting composition was. And I just loved all these smaller branches that are just, you know, intermingling their way through these larger trees. Here's another way to shoot trees. It's not really that Japanese woodcut look, but it's like, you know, and I think I did have in the back of my mind an image that Ansel Adams took that looks a lot like this. That doesn't mean that mine is in any way close to what Ansel Adams did, but he did take an image of young, these are trees are no more than one or two years old. Um, and I just love the way they're all sort of interconnected and they're all sort of touching each other. There's like a relationship, a symbiotic relationship between all these trees. And the only really thing I did with this one is I purposely darkened down the background because I wanted there to create, I wanted a little more contrast between the actual trees and the, um, and the background. But again, nothing man-made, no houses, no cars, no people, just the actual trees. Uh, some people in my neighborhood have sillily planted bamboo as a way to, um, let's get rid of that one. Um, to separate their house from their neighbor's house. The problem is, is once you plant bam, once you plant bamboo, you can't get rid of it, and it's even hard to trim. And people don't realize that when they plant it. But I was just taking a walk in the neighborhood one day, and I just came across this little bamboo stand. Um, and I just liked the way that certain ones were straight and certain ones were at an angle. I liked the way the leaves were rhythmically placed throughout the image. And I purposely darkened down the background on this one to give it a little more pop and a little more contrast. But this is, you know, just walking around in your neighborhood, you can sometimes find some really interesting um, compositions to create. Um, another tree that I came across that I loved, I just love the rhythm of the tree. You know, certain trees, they just, they just speak to you, right? As a photographer, you're out driving around and you see a solo tree, we call them solo trees. And it's just like, oh, I like the way that one looks. I like the angle that it's on. Now, what I did with this one is I collect hand tinted photographs by people like Wallace Nutting and Fred Thompson. And as I began to work on this image, I realized that I could kind of make it look like one of those hand tinted photographs. And that's kind of what I did with my color palette. And if you held this one up next to 
you know, uh, one of the hand tinted photographs that I collect, it is remarkably similar. So again, it's not my own style necessarily because I'm sort of emulating what other photographers did before color photography was around, but I really do like the way that it came out and I really do like this tree. And once I find a tree that I like, I make a note usually using my phone and its GPS location so that I can find it again. Because sometimes you just find these things when you're just driving around and you don't have a real good sense of you know, where you are. Now, this tree I've been shooting for over 15 years. This was probably shot the same day that we had that ice storm because I can see similar formations. Um, you know, I said before to keep going back to places that you like. You know, this guy, he's sort of like a friend of mine because I've been shooting this guy for, as I said, over 15 years. And he stands by himself, you know, in a, for in a, in a field. And I know one of these times I'm going to go back and he won't be there anymore. He will have been blown down or she, it could be a she, uh, or some developer will buy the farm and build uh, townhouses. But as long as the tree is still standing, I'm going to keep going back a couple of times a year. It's part of a route that I take and keep shooting it. So this is what it looked like, I think, that same day that I shot the ice storm. But this is what it also looked like on another day, a completely different perspective on the same tree. A uh, little bit of snow on the ground. I left a little color in the corn, in the fallow corn, and I had a really nice stormy sky um, behind it. So again, you know, two different versions. Um, that is the same tree as this, although they don't look at all similar, you know, between those two images. Uh, another thing that I like to shoot in Baltimore is the fading industrial base of the city. You know, Baltimore, like many other East Coast cities and Midwest cities, uh, were built on the Industrial Revolution. And a lot of the row homes that are found throughout Baltimore were built to house the workers that worked in these various mills and factories. Now, most of them are gone. Most of them have been raised to the ground and the, the land has been used for other purposes. This is about the last one left in, within the city limits. And you can tell there's the name of the company. It's the Crown Cork and Seal Company. This was the company responsible for making almost all the bottle caps in America from about 1915 to about 1928. They all were made at the Crown Cork and Seal Company. And I kind of stumbled across this one day um, and I parked my car and I walked in and this was the first thing that I saw was this scene right in front of me. And I was like, holy moly, what a great scene. And I love this work safely today. I've never seen today hyphenated before. Um, and unfortunately someone took this upside down stop sign which is really unfortunate because it's really a big part of the picture. Um, and the colors, I have not saturated these colors or pumped them up. That's actually what colors I saw when I first took my first look down this corridor, which is where trucks used to come through. Because as you go down this corridor, it leads you into a pretty big industrial area. So this was sort of the opening shot. And these were some of the things that I found as I walked around. This was a, a, a corrugated steel warehouse that was in very bad repair. I'm sure it's going to get knocked to the ground at some point. Um, and I had a, an enormous wall to choose from to, to create a composition. So the question was, well, how was I, what was the best way to create it? Well, I knew I wanted to keep this slanted pat this one in down here because he's a real important part. He's now gone too, unfortunately. But the other important part of this image was where I left these black empty spaces. And I think where I left them, again, creates kind of a nice rhythmic pattern, um, which is then broken up by these different corrugated panels. And I also love the rust colored um, coloring on some of these panels. 
So this was an image that I didn't even consider converting to black and white because I would have lost all that rust color, which really I think is an intrinsic um, part of the image. But other scenes that you found there was like, you know, I came across this door. I don't think this door has been opened in 80 years. I mean, from the way that it looked and from the padlock that was on it and from where in the complex I found it. Um, so, you know, the first time I came across this complex, I just had a blast because then I moved on to the windows. And you could see that behind the window is actually a cyclone fence. And then behind the cyclone fence is wood paneling. So this was obviously a building that was being shored up for some reason or was getting ready to be destroyed or whatever. But I saw these windows and to me, this was like shooting portraits. Uh, so you don't necessarily need perspective when you're shooting portraits. You don't need depth when you're shooting portraits. You really just want to capture the surface scene. And so this was one of the windows that I came across. And here's another one. And I just love the patterns of the broken glass and the mesh fence and the wood behind it. It just create and they made beautiful prints. They just really turned out well. Uh, and I like the square format. Um, for a window. It just seemed to really work. This is a, another not quite as faded piece of Baltimore. This is actually closer to my house, but what really appealed to me in this image was this metal stairway. I love the, the whole metal stairway. And the problem always was that there were cars and trucks parked at the bottom. And one day I drove by and there were no cars and trucks. And that was my cue to pull over and get my tripod out and put my wide angle lens on and get the sweep, the whole sweep of the stairway from the top all the way to the bottom. Um, and again, these are brick buildings that were once factories and warehouses that are now being used for different kinds of cottage industries, artists, studios, all sorts of things. And I think that's great because these are really beautiful buildings. This was right, this is right across the street from the stairway. This is an old abandoned warehouse. Um, I have no idea what its future holds. I don't think anyone is gonna try and reuse the building. Um, I purposely came back a little bit later in the day because I wanted to get this raking light across from this um, corrugated roof uh, into the center of the image. And I will tell you that in this image, right dead center was a no parking sign that was very modern and that had to go. So that got cloned out. I'm not big on cloning things out of images, but that was an example that that particular sign just didn't go with the rest of the image. And I just call this number two because that's what it was, that's what it was labeled. All right, so let's talk about Baltimore briefly. And this is sort of getting to the tail end. This is a still scene taken from The Wire. I don't know how many of you in my audience have seen The Wire, but The Wire it was a five season TV show uh, shot and made in Baltimore by a brilliant guy named David Simon. I think it's, I personally think it's the greatest thing ever made for television. Um, and the first time I watched The Wire all the way through, all five seasons, it was for the storyline because there were so many, there were like 40 main characters that you had to keep track of, which was kind of difficult. But the second and third times I rewatched the whole series, it was more to see kind of where and how it was shot. And the guy that did, was the production designer was kind enough to actually produce a map of where the wire was shot in what is now a defunct alternative newspaper that we used to get for free called the city paper. And so I remember clipping out that map and then beginning my exploration of Baltimore. So this was a scene from the wire. And this was one of the first shots that I did in any of the areas that the wire was shot in. And I saw that Baltimore believe, and that's what really drew me to this. Um, Baltimore is getting better 
in general, we still have though 30 to 40,000 abandoned homes in Baltimore, which is like way too many. And a lot of these were the homes that were built to house the workers whose jobs don't exist anymore. And so these houses were basically abandoned and the city is trying its best to, you know, to keep up with the, you know, the knocking them down or the renovating of some of them that are still in pretty good shape. So this is in an area, the city tried to build a mall within the city limits called Old Town Mall, which was a total disaster. But I used to like going there to shoot. And this was one day that I was there and I just, I just liked the way this guy was strolling down the street. He's wearing my colors. I'm an Oriole fan. So he's wearing an Oriole hat. He's wearing an Oriole, uh, an orange shirt. And I wish he was a little more to the left, but I kind of still like him. I like his white socks. I like his cane. I like the fact that he's under the New Hope Christian Fellowship sign. Um, so this became one of the shots that I took at the Old Town Mall. This is one of the outsides of what the old town mall looks like today. Um, so you can see it's really fallen on terrible times. Where you see that sharp dressed man, this rectangle, that used to be covered with plastic sheeting. So it was very unattractive. And one day I drove by and the plastic sheeting had either blown down or someone had taken it down. And the minute I saw that, and then I saw the sharp dressed man with that arrow and the shape that these windows were in, it was like, yep, this is what I wanted to shoot. And you can even see there, it says the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. That, used, that was printed on the building probably, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, um, the, you know, the precursor for A&P. So this is just my continued exploration of Baltimore. Now, we had in Baltimore uh, a photographer that worked for the Baltimore Sun, our main newspaper, and he was actually a great photographer. His name, his name was A. Aubrey Bodine, and he was a member of the Baltimore Camera Club, I should add. Um, these are what the white marble steps outside of people's row homes used to look like. The, this was way before I was ever in Baltimore. In the 50s and 60s, women supposedly would come out every Saturday morning with their buckets and their brushes and their Ajax, and they would clean these stairs so that they were shiny white. Now, I knew that there was no way I was going to find a block of stairs or a row of stairs that were anywhere in the kind of condition that these were in. So what I pre preconceived in my mind, which is another thing to do about imagery is, you know, sometimes you have an image in your mind that you haven't found yet. And I had an image in my mind of what the stairs must look like today. The first problem I ran into is a lot of people put railings up for safety purposes, you know, so they could hold on to a railing. Well, that didn't fit my image of the image that I had in my head. But one day driving through West Baltimore, I came across this scene. And this is exactly what I had in my head. No railings. And this is what the white marble steps look like on this particular block today. Um, filthy, dirty. I didn't place any of the props there. That's a, that's a half burnt yellow pages. There are liquor bottles down in the corner. Um, as I said, Baltimore, you know, we're, we're, we're doing better but it's still a city that is very lacking in opportunity. Its educational system is still quite poor. There's still a lot of inequality in Baltimore. Um, and I hope that my photography, I'm not trying to take advantage of that situation at all. I'm really trying to highlight some of that with, um, with my photography. So this was, a pre, this was an image I had in the back of my mind for years until I finally found it. Um, and as soon as I drove by this one block, I was like, ah, that's what I've been thinking about. So here's another example. I'm going to turn my heater down here. Here's another example. The first thing I noticed that as I was driving down this block was that doll that was nestled in those cinder blocks. And I first just shot her. 
but that wasn't giving me the depth and perspective on the scene that I really wanted to give it. And again, by getting low down and including her as the main object, but it also including the whole sweep of the street all the way to the buildings that you can see in the background, it makes for a much more effective image than just the doll you know, surrounded by cinder blocks. Um, that might make an interesting abstract, but it wasn't sort of what I was going for. Um, and this block is actually mostly abandoned at the time that I shot it, but there were some houses toward the end that were still occupied. Uh, these are occupied. These are the backs of occupied row homes in a different part of Baltimore. And what intrigued me on this image was the color tonality, which I just love. I love that gray tonality and the, the seemingly random nature that those items are scattered throughout those backyards, the chairs, the crutch, um, the stool on the left-hand side. And it just became a composition decision. What part of this row back of these row homes do I want to include? You know, and I purposely kept these white objects, the door and the window as the anchor point. And then the rest of the image sort of flowed from there. I wanted to include the chimneys, which are just very old style chimneys. And I even grew to like, you know, the telephone pole that sort of gives you some context in the, um, in the back. I looked at this as black and white as well, but I really like that gray tonality of it. And I purposely turned the saturation down a little bit. So it, it wasn't quite as, um, as gray. Uh, here's an example of me coming across a scene which I was drawn to because there's one occupied house surrounded by three unoccupied houses and someone owns a motorcycle or some vehicle that they think highly enough that they've covered you know, in blue plastic. But this image rapidly became this image. I, after a while, I developed sort of an HDR preset look, which I started to apply to some of the Baltimore architecture that I was shooting. So this is three images merged together. Uh, I think I put them, I think there's a topaz filter that I use, and I also do some work in Lightroom. And I purposely left some context on the right-hand side of the image and on the left-hand side of the image. So you can see that this is part of a bigger scene. It's not just the row of these four houses. Um, but I like the way this one came out much better than the one I just showed you. It's just a much more artistic and a much more interesting way of interpreting um, the scene. And this is a similar, I use that preset again, but I turned the strength down. What really impressed me about this building was whoever did the tagging, the graffiti, they actually were brave enough to do it as they came down these rickety looking uh, fire escape stairs because that's how they got the rest of it spray painted. So that really impressed me that someone took the effort to do that. I also love the detail on this wooden balcony up here. And I love the ala on the bottom. I like the chimneys. I like the tree on the left. And then the trick to this one became correcting the perspective so that, it, you know, the keystoning effect was pretty extreme. And so I really worked hard to straighten out as many of the things that I could to make the image look like it looks now. And this is, you know, right off of a major avenue in, in Baltimore called North Avenue. Uh, and I think it's still there. I think the building is still standing, uh, although it's unoccupied. This was one of my earlier shots of Baltimore. And what first attracted me was this cross on the door. Uh, I just love that white cross on the door. And, I, and these houses next door are occupied, but just the houses themselves wasn't a good enough composition. I really needed to balance the composition. And what helped me balance this composition was this beautiful tree that's sitting in what's called Baltimore Cemetery and this line from the sidewalk that leads you right to where I want you to lead, right to the tree. And so this tree and this line balances out what's on the left. And so it forms a uniform 
composition that has some nice tone and some nice rhythm you know, to it. And that's what I'm always looking for. You know, I first find the scene and then I look for ways in which I can make the composition stronger, you know, how to, how to add some balance, how to add some rhythm to it. Uh, I normally criticize people for shooting other people's art. I, but I love the way that this side of the building, which I knew was going to be demolished within about a week of me getting this picture. Uh, it was so interesting to me. And I love the staircase that's coming down through it that I broke my own rule and I did shoot other people's art, but I just love the way they, the group of people that worked on this building tagged it. I just think it's really artistically done and it's now completely gone because it was a part of a warehouse that had been sitting in disrepair for 20 years and now it's been raised to the ground and I'm not sure what's coming in its place. Probably uh, another warehouse or, or maybe some maybe some low to moderate income housing. That's what we really need. But we also have Baltimore that looks like this. And you know these are the row homes of Baltimore uh, that I refer to. Um, you can find homes like this throughout the city. Um, this happens to be, these happen to be in a pretty trendy neighborhood, not too far from where I live. So these row homes, which are not very big, they go for like three to $350,000 now. Um, and I showed this to someone, another photographer, and she blurted out, that's, I live in that blue house. I said, oh my God, I never knew that, Karen. And so we then did a print exchange. I said, well, you know, how about if I give you a print of mine and you, I'll pick one of yours. And we did a print exchange, which, were, which was a great idea to, to get another piece of art in the house. Um, and her work is really quite good. She does it all on iPhones, but it's really excellent work. But she was amazed when I showed her this picture and she said, oh my God, that's, you know, you took a picture of my house. Now, again, what I got lucky with was no cars. And that was always the problem. Whenever I drove up this block, and it is as slanty and as hilly as it looks, there were always cars in front. And that really made this picture impossible to, to, to get. And the one day that I drove up, there were no cars. And so I was like, OK, I can grab it. So when we take images, we have no idea of how important they may become in our lives. I took this image about six or seven years ago and uh, in an area near where those row homes are, but in a slightly dingier neighborhood. And when I saw that someone had spray painted still alive on this mesh, it was just like, oh, that's definitely a picture. Fast forward to 2019 and I am diagnosed with lymphoma. Um, which is a type of cancer. And if you're going to get sick, Baltimore is a great place to get sick in because we have Johns Hopkins and we've got University of Maryland and we've got great health care in Baltimore. And so I'm now cancer free. But this image became so important to me that every time I posted a health update on Facebook or some other social media, this was the image that I would always accompany it with. I'm still here. I'm still alive. This thing isn't going to beat me. Fast forward again, and we come to, into COVID. And this image takes on a whole new value of we are being still alive uh, as a society. And we're going to try our best to not let this, you know, this scourge defeat us. So you just never know sometimes when you take an image, a real simple image like this, how important you know, it can be throughout your photography life, um, because this is now, you know, an image that I'll really treasure because it has so much meaning to me personally. Um, going back to that whole thing about emotionally connected, if I'm, if I'm, if there's one image that I'm emotionally connected to, it's this one right here. And this is where I'm going to leave you with a great thought. There is always hope. I'm just waiting online for ice cream this past summer. And there's a guy in front of me who has a lot of ink. And I noticed on his arm that he had tattooed, there is always hope. And I just had my camera with me and just grabbed it and just 
popped a shot or two and um and i just like the way it, you know it came out and i love it as a as an ending message to a to a presentation because no matter how poorly things look there is always hope so with that i'm going to um stop share and the floor is now open for questions, comments, um, open discussion, what, what anyone wants to talk about. Well, I really enjoyed this very much. Thank I, you. I love your perspective. Wonderful photographs. Love seeing Baltimore. Uh, love the wire. I've watched it twice. Yep. Now, what f-stop is your go-to f-stop? Do you have a go-to f-stop? Yep. No. No, no, really. It all depends on what really totally depends on what I'm shooting. Okay. You know, it, if I want the background faded out, then I'm going to go to a low aperture. If I want it really sharp, as much as sharp as possible, I try, you know, I'll go up to F16. But no, I, I generally am shooting on either aperture or shutter priority. Um, and that also depends on what I'm shooting. If motion is involved, well, then, you know, shutter priority might be the way to go. If there's no motion involved, then, you know, then the scene might determine what aperture I want to use. And so then I go to aperture priority. I'm very rarely shooting in manual and I never shoot in program. I've never really even quite understood program mode. Um, so um, the scene generally decides for me a lot of things like my vantage point and what settings I'm going to use and to some degree what lens I'm going to use. Okay. So thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'm glad you're a fan of the wire. <laughs> well, Lucas, uh, Lewis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed the program. Um, a bit, I used to live close to Baltimore uh, some years ago. I didn't go into that part of town. Yeah. Maybe I should have. Well, <laughs> why not? Anybody else have any questions of Lewis? Well, thank you very much. All right. And please I understand you do other programs. Uh, yeah, I have one on, um, I do one on the art of black and white photography. We'll probably be back in touch sometime. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Evening. It was very oh, good. Very good. Okay. And remember, fill out your thank survey. You guys. Back. Thank you. Done. Thank you, Lewis. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that wraps it up for the evening, folks. Thank you so much for being here. See you next month. Take care now. Good night. Good night.